Well, welcome everybody to HydroTerra's latest webinar in our webinar series. Today, our topic is all about passive soil vapour measurement and how we can use that data. We've had a fair bit of help putting this presentation together. And I'm really appreciative of that help. Uh, in this particular instance, we've got Dr. Brent Davey, who's co-presenting today. He's the Principal Environmental Consultant for Fife, and a bit more on him later. But I've also had a lot of support from Gary Hurst, who's Technical Director from, of Land Quality and Remediation with SLR Consulting, and Gary's been very helpful in putting some slides together in this presentation, but I will be presenting his slides. Uh, we've also had uh, some support from Beacon Environmental, one of our suppliers who's also provided content today. So a real team effort pulling together this presentation for yourselves today. Fantastic turnout for this one. We've got over 250 odd registrants for this. So obviously soil vapour is of interest to the industry and great to have you all here today. Right. So before we get started, just a few things. So we love your questions and uh, Brent and myself will do our best to answer those questions at the end. If you have a question, please use the Q&A button at the top of your screen and write your question in there. And at the end, I will read them out and we will then do our best to answer them. So a little bit about our speakers. You probably, most of you would probably know me by now after all these webinars. So I'm the Managing Director of HydroTerra. I have worked quite a lot in the area of soil vapour uh, around contaminated sites assessment management. Um, Gary Hurst, the Technical Director, Land Quality and Remediation with SLR Consulting. He's done a lot of work with uh, soil vapour uh, particularly utilising one of the technologies, Beacon, which HydroTerra is a distributor for, but he's utilised that a lot with mapping groundwater contaminant plumes, and there's some good information in, uh, in this presentation about that. But then our special guest, Dr Brent Davey, Principal Environmental consultant with Fife is someone I've been working with on and off over the last 30 years and it's great to have you here Brent. Uh, so Brent is my co-presenter today. Um, Brent's been working in the field for about 40 years. Uh, originally he studied as a microbiologist and did his PhD in that area. He's quite passionate about how various microbes break down toxic compounds and has a wealth of experience with assessing such breakdown pathways and their metabolites. He has worked in the sort of laboratory field, working with the Australian government analytical laboratories. So he's got a unique blend of uh, expertise really. So there's the laboratory side, there's the microbial side, and there's the contaminated sites side of things. Uh, he's got a lot of, hands-on experience dealing with these soil vapour sampling devices and monitoring and really brings a lot of hands-on experience with where things can go wrong uh, and how to use these things and when. So welcome to you Brent and uh, without further ado I think we will hand over to yourself. Whoop, about now. <laughs> Okay, um, it's, it's helpful in all of this if we um, perhaps go back to the, to the beginning, well, maybe not that far back, but um, at least um, ask ourselves, you know, where have we come from? Um, what did we used to do? And for most people studying, you know, air um, contamination, it began with air pumps. Um, where you got, uh, it used to be the standard asbestos air pump, which just drew air through a filter. Um, but instead of a filter, you could add a, um, um, a, a, an absorbent cartridge. And that's what you see in the little image on the, on the left of your screen. 
that thing looks a bit like a cigarette stash in the, the device is actually a, uh, an absorbent cartridge through which the air in the room is being drawn by this pump. Um, and they work by um, pumping away and they're meant to be pumping away at a constant rate. And uh, you leave them go for as long as you can um, to get the greatest sensitivity you can. Um, and then the cartridge gets sent off to the lab and analysed and they work out what the concentration in the air is. The difficulty with the pumps is that while they were quite noisy, um, the, they tended to be to blend into the background and people um, didn't realise they were there. And so very often your results were compromised uh, by um, for other reasons than what you're likely to think. And for example, uh, in this image, there's a tin of thinners uh, immediately in the shelf immediately below the machine. And um, uh, while it was closed, um, we have no idea the extent to which it might have impacted the result. So there are a few issues. Um, in the next slide, um, the, um, you know, it, it, the, the same technology could be applied to um, in-ground wells. Um, you know, multi-levels and that sort of stuff. Um, but as you'll see in that little image on the left, uh, the, the whole issue is getting rather complicated. Uh, each pump is pumping its own um, well, if you like, to a different depth. Um, but because we've got or needed to use different absorbents for different target um, chemicals um, in the, uh, the soil gas, um, you ha start having these Christmas trees of, of um, um, tubing, which introduces all sorts of difficulties and takes a long while to set up. Um, and uh, you know, the technology started to be limited by how many of these pumps you had available. But one of the other major limitations of the old pumping systems were that they ran out of puff. Um, you'd be lucky to get 10 hours out of them. Um, which meant that you often had to set them late in the afternoon and then go, go away and come back in the morning and, and uh, um, collect them again to get your greatest sensitivity. Um, next slide. Uh, the other way that you looked at soil um, gas, uh, in this case, um, the interface between soil gas, which is the um, the gas between particles of soil in the soil matrix and soil vapour, which is what comes out, um, uh, trans uh, crosses the surface and becomes, um, enters the air, is to use flux boxes. And you can do it yourself. Um, but these were um, homemade and still relied on the asbestos pumps, and still relied on, you know, had limitations as to time and so on. Um, the beauty of these sorts of designs is you can actually run concurrent controls for what's in the atmosphere, but nevertheless, they were fiddly, time consuming, and you had to do lots of testing to make sure that there wasn't leaks and that sort of stuff. So, so what was wrong with the old gear? Um, its sensitivity was limited to how long you could pump. Basically, the calculation was how much air did you pull through the absorbent? Um, and based on the concentration that the laboratory recovered from that absorbent, you could then work out what the concentration in air probably was. Um, however, you had to assume that the pump pumped constantly. And that's a real issue in the sense that um, if they weren't new, and generally we hired these things, so they'd been used a million times before. Um, even if they were calibrated, they didn't necessarily keep pumping constantly. So you were dealing with uh, uncertainties as to the volume it had it, um, dealt with. Um, if you're looking for low levels, you had to try and pump for as long as possible, which meant that you needed probably two days on site as a minimum. Um, and the gas train, you know, the sampling train had all sorts of issues as well. You often needed to put a, vapor, a water vapour trap in, um, other pre-filters, um, so there were lots of branches and tea pieces and lots of other stuff. Um, and I can remember some of 
my field guys working on this would take a whole morning to set up one particular array at one um, uh, sample location. And as we'll get to, that was one of the reasons I think that this new technology has been um, developed. And the other thing is that the pumps are quite noisy and in a household setting or something like that, they can be very obtrusive, but maybe not intrusive, obtrusive enough. Um, one of the aims in indoor sampling is that you sample the place as it is, where people don't realise in a sense that, that the sampling is happening um, so that you can get a fair estimate of just what's going on in the space. Um, but if, what you don't want to have happen is people opening tins of, of thinners or uh, starting painting with turp space paint um, while you're doing the measuring. It's happened. Um, so <clears throat> what's turned up? I guess the first of these um, historically were similar canisters. Um, and I'll talk about all of these things shortly. Um, very smart idea. Um, just a big tin, basically. Um, quite sophisticated, of course. Um, in which you, into which you um, were able to introduce your air sample. Um, close it off and it's done. Um, it's, they're remarkably effective in, in practice, but I'll talk some more about them. I think Beacon were actually next. Um, they developed their passive soil gas samplers and because of Gary's um, great experience and expertise with these and the fact that Richard's um, uh, uh, the local Australian agent for them, um, I thought I won't spend much time just to say that they really do have an important place in this and were one of the first and the simplest. Um, then uh, the University of Waterloo in Canada has been doing lots of work in these sorts of advanced sampling technologies and they developed this very simple um, device called the Waterloo Membrane Sampler. Um, it's really just like a, a standard gas uh, soil, um, um, the TPH files, um, which has got a crimp seal with a membrane at the top. In this case, the membrane is um, water resistant. It's a dimethyl silane or siloxane membrane, which doesn't let water through with virtually everything else. And inside the vial is an absorbent, um, usually even just granulated um, uh, carbon, activated charcoal. Um, and uh, you, leave, you can leave it in place for quite a long time. And I'll talk about that some more. And then finally, there's um, in the recent years, there's been this uh, device called the Radiello, which I'll talk about. Okay, Richard, next one, please. So similar canisters, a lot of you will probably have met these things. Um, they're quite sophisticated um, canisters as it happens, um, partly because they need to be reused. Uh, they're sufficiently expensive to do that. And therefore they need to be cleaned. And given that we are talking parts per trillion type analysis, they've got to be very clean. So these are um, very well-made stainless steel spheres. Um, they're coated with a, um, um, a, a silicone um, coating inside so that as far as possible, nothing sticks to them. Um, and then they are fitted with a, um, a tap system, which includes a vacuum um, gauge. Um, and basically what happens is that the laboratory cleans them out and then pumps them down to very low um, pressures inside so that you've, you've basically got a contained vacuum. And what you then do is hook it up to your site, as in the picture on the right there, um, hook it up to um, a, a gas bore in the ground or even just open it to the air and turn the tap open and suck in um, a volume of air. The trick is that you have to keep a residual vacuum in these things so that the lab can work out exactly how much air has been sucked in. If you were to leave these canisters just open um, the, uh, so that there was it equilibrated with atmosphere, the lab actually wouldn't be able to use, work out what the uh, concentration in air was because uh, 
it actually makes working out the volume of air inhaled by these things uh, very difficult. Um, and as I say, uh, they're conceptually very simple, but they're often fraught in practice. There's lots of valves. The gauges um, are notoriously slow reacting. Um, so you've got to watch them like a hawk. Um, and really, uh, as I say, you can't leave them unattended. So they were an intermediate step, but they were a hell of a lot easier than using um, the, the old pumped systems. And like the pump systems, they're not quite totally passive, but they're a good step in that direction. Next one, Richard, please. So um, get to beacon samplers. Um, and because they're, um, you know, Richard's terrain, I'll um, get him to talk about them in greater detail. So I'll skip over this, except to say that they are really quite easy to install, a little bit fiddly, but with practice, they're, they're really good. The main thing you need to be aware of, and it's not necessarily a disadvantage, but you need to be aware of that there's currently, I think only one lab in the States, sorry, one lab on the planet, and that's in the States, um, which does the analysis. Um, it's because it's a very special absorbent matrix, um, but the, the results are uh, really exceptional and, and remarkably reliable, so it's, it's worth doing. Um, I'll leave that to Richard to talk you through the details of beacons. Next one, please. There's the radiolos. Um, these, I think, are one of the, the big advances of recent times. Um, there are limitations, but um, their one advantage is that they're available for most of the analytical laboratories in this country. Um, and they are very good for um, hydrocarbons and other volatiles in air. Um, because that you can get two different types of absorbent. Um, by the way, the way these come, you get this little blue triangular um, mounting plate, um, which you don't need to use necessarily. There are other things, the blue bit at the bottom, you can get separately and it just seals off the, um, the diffuser. The uh, orange and blue or yellow and blue device is the diffusing um, cartridge itself. And inside that fits that brown, um, that's the actual absorbent which fits inside the diffuser. And you, once you've retrieved the sample, you just pop it in that little tube up there and they provide these barcodes. Um, remembering that, um, these absorbents are so sensitive that if you were to use a, yeah, um, a texture or something like that, or um, even a standard adhesive label, it'll pick up components of the, the ink and the label and that sort of stuff. So these barcode labels are quite important part of the system. Um, now, while most of the Australian labs will provide you with just uh, the two types, 130 and 145, um, it's worth remembering that this same technology is available for measuring lots of other things um, if you need to, and very good at it. Um, the other fundamental thing about um, beacons, about radiellos and waterloos, is that rather than depending on the volume of air, um, they depend on um, equilibrium factors so that um, they can give you the same answer like what is your concentration in your air, but it's based on um, a calibration of the devices that um, has been done by the manufacturers and various other people, um, so that uh, you don't need to know what your volume is. So these are great for sticking in holes um, in, in indoor spaces and those sorts of things where you don't necessarily um, have a, a pump running and you don't necessarily know what the, the volume is, but by their very nature, they tell you what the equilibrium concentration of um, your particular um, uh, target compound is. Next one, please, Richard. The, the beauty about um, uh, radiellos is that they can be, like so many of these other uh, devices, is that they can be left um, in situ for either very short times or um, days to weeks. And 
particularly radiello, which has been developed for just this purpose, they can be used for anything from workplace monitoring for a few hours um, to, um, to um, weeks to get you a really sensitive uh, uh, determination. The main difficulty with uh, the radiello system is that the diffusion shield in particular is potentially susceptible to fouling by soil um, or water. Um, and so these are best, they, they'll, you can use them for in-ground sampling, but you need to be aware of this risk, but um, they're best um, in above ground work um, in indoor air or even just outdoor air. They, they work very, very well. Next one, please, Richie. The, I guess the, the technology of choice is either for um, measuring in ground um, are either beacons or the waterloo membrane samplers. And this is just a quick rundown of their, um, their design. The key component is this PDMS membrane, um, which allows soil gas, soil vapor, all those components into the vial, but doesn't allow water and doesn't get blocked by water. That's the important thing. Um, and then the absorbent uh, sort of picks it up and, and the lab We'll take this whole thing and elute the uh, uh, whatever's been absorbed on the on the soil. Um, so they're very useful in that sense, um, and that's as simple as it comes to to install the things. You can even just hang them in an airspace if necessary, but they're very easy to use in soil bores, those sorts of things. Next one, please, Richard. Uh, Waterloo again is uh, offered by most of the labs. Um, there are, two different types, sizes. Um, there are, but they've also got these thick membrane and low uptake versions, which are good for, you know, you leave them in place and come back a month later. Um, and they can still, the laboratory's result can still be interpreted in terms of what the concentration of your particular target analyte is in, um, in the soil vapor um, or the soil gas rather. Um, and this is particularly important if you're looking for breakdown products of things like chlorinated ethenes, you know, PCE, TCE, um, or even metabolites of, of other um, components, hydrocarbons and so on, um, because they may not be present at the sort of concentrations of your standard contaminants, um, but you want to be able to pick them up. So again, the Waterloo's are particularly good for these in-ground applications. So um, I think Richard's now going to take over and look at the, uh, give you some more details on the beacons. Thanks very much, Brent. Um, I did add one slide in here. You might want to comment on this one too, Brent, just to yeah. put you on the spot. Um, so it seemed to me you were talking about canisters and sorbents and I guess this slide seemed to summarise when you might use what. So I just talked about. That's, I mean, this is particularly useful. Um, it's, yeah, the, the, the virtue of canisters is that they're good for the, the more volatile, um, uh, you know, methane, um, propane, those sorts of things. And the, the short chain um, compounds that are, are very volatile, what, canisters can't handle are the things that are frankly not volatile or the labs call semi-volatile. Um, and as, as this diagram shows, the limit's about C10. Um, so PAHs, those sorts of things are simply not um, something you can pick up in canisters. But the beauty about the different um, sorbents that are available is that you can cover the whole range up to really quite large molecules um, using um, uh, one or another of the solvents. Beacons certainly will. Um, Radiellos can. Waterloos uh, perhaps less so because you are looking at the, you're strictly looking at the, the most volatiles um, in the system. If you look at that, the, this diagram, the second run um, down, the VACs slash SVACs, and the standard TO17, um, it's fair to say that beacons Radiolos and Waterloos can handle that range. I'd suggest that if you are concerned about the heavier hydrocarbons, um, 
beacons are probably uh, superior. Um, they can all manage the uh, TA15 range um, and so can canisters, but not quite as well. Depends on, on the molecular weights. Well done, Brent. That was a very good uh, commentary on the slide that I snuck in for you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about the importance of the conceptual site models for these surveys. It's one thing to take a measurement. It's another thing to actually sort of be able to put it in context and uh, make sure we know why we're, why we're measuring where. Um, so some of these slides were put together by Gary and thank you very much to Gary from SLR. Uh, really appreciate that. Um, some of them have also come from Beacon. So what are the things we need to think about when we're looking at this, this passive sampling approach? The first thing is that uh, not all volatiles are the same. So what does that mean? Well, it means that some volatiles are less volatile than others and therefore tend to partition more to the soil matrix and less to the soil vapor. So if you're measuring for these things, those which are more volatile, you're obviously going to pick up uh, more than those that are semi-volatile. So we talk about Henry's law constant, which is a way of uh, effectively talking about the relative uh, volatility volatility of such things and how they partition. And uh, there's plenty of good references around which can give you a list of compounds and those constants. Um, some compounds are difficult to detect in soil. Okay, so sometimes they're only uh, uh, present in very low concentrations. So what Brent was talking about with the sensitivity of some of these samples and the associated lab analysis becomes really important. Uh, you can have a high degree of variability in the solubility of these compounds. And I think it used to be called an octanal water partition coefficient. I think is what that refers to there, which is the ability of a contaminant to partition into water from the soil. So these things all affect what we actually see when we collect a sample. Okay. Um, also, I suspect most of you know, like we have our light non-aqueous phase liqu liquids and our dense non-aqueous phase liquids. Well, this affects where you might find them and where they might accumulate. So depending on where we deploy, we may or may not see more or less of those. That becomes really important when you're trying to, I guess, quantify what the scale of remediation is, because you might just come across a pocket of it because you've chosen to put a sampler in a certain area. Compositions of NAPL may affect solubility. Well, that's quite a complicated one, but basically NAPLs or various compounds can get together and that can affect their relative solubility. Okay, so a compound on its own versus how it might behave as a mixture can change. Emissions of volatile organic compounds and semi-volatile organic compounds may be highly variable in a spatial sense. They do tend to accumulate in certain areas and, and why that happens uh, relates to a few things that I think Gary refers to below. So vertical and soil texture variances may result in vapor sources accumulating in some areas or being hidden in low permeability soils. Okay, so it's funny when you do your, uh, some of you may have done, you know, hand augering and uh, PID measurements. You get your sandy soils, it tends to, the vapor whooshes out of those sandy soils pretty quickly. Uh, whereas for your clay soils, you sometimes have to physically break open those uh, soils to actually get a meaningful reading. So, you know, a lot of you have probably seen in a hands-on sense exactly that happening, but it does affect how vapors are distributed in the subsurface. So traditional vapor sampling may still be required, but it doesn't mean your source extent and intensity has been fully developed. So I suppose what Gary might be referring to as traditional air might be some of the stuma canister stuff that Brent was showing you earlier. Um, 
Next slide. Well, maybe before we do, so just me looking at these schematics on the right hand side. It's all about that partitioning piece, okay? So a contaminant or a compound can be attached to a soil particle in part and reach some kind of equilibrium with the pore space between it. If it's been there long enough, you tend to do get that equilibrium. What does that equilibrium look like? Well, it depends on the soil, like the organic content of those soil pits for example, and that depends on the nature of the compounds themselves. Uh, next slide. So what is a conceptual site model? Well, it's really, that schematic on this slide is a pretty good example of a really well done one. Uh, often they're not graphically so magnificent. But uh, in there, we need to look at what are the contaminants of concern, right? So what are we actually looking for? And we get that from our site history. What is the source and the mechanism of release? So that might be an underground storage tank. It might be an adjacent property and those contaminants are flowing down along the groundwater. It might be the, uh, the vapors are actually moving along underground surfaces. That's a common one, right? And that can lead to a really large spread of contaminants. Um, so what are the primary and secondary transport mechanisms? What's really driving the movement of those vapors is what we try to work out as part of our conceptual model. In the end, these passive samplers do help us a lot to determine what the lateral and vertical extent of the contamination is. It also provides us with some indication of where those vapors are actually going in terms of what receptors are potentially being exposed to by those vapors. Brent, can you see that? Thanks. Yes. Okay, I've lost a couple of minutes, so I might charge on a little bit. A few things we need to know, okay, to really get this meaningful is what was the activity event and timing associated with the release of the contamination? That is not always easy to find out. We need to try and define our source areas. We need to understand our lithology. So that's the type of soil and geology beneath the site. We want to define the lateral and vertical extent of the impact and we want to have a go at analysing the risk, which means we need to know what those concentrations are and what those receptors are. What makes it hard, okay, uh, is that these things tend to be variable, right, and they vary with time. Um, and they're not uh, clearly distributed. It's not a, a uniform world under there. So we use various high resolution tools to help us to characterize our site. There's some examples on the left of some downhole uh, imagery. I think it's uh, using a, the MIPT technology, the MIHPT uh, technology, which provides further information down through the profile to help inform such things. Um, one of the techniques, right, is passive soil vapor, right? So getting our high resolution data. What does it look like? So this is some examples of beacon sampling. So really what this sort of technology gives you is the ability to put lots of samples in the ground at a much lower cost than using a traditional drill rig, for example. And you leave them there and you can get some really nice spatial resolution of what those vapors are there. So that's a really powerful tool. And uh, given the nature of the absorbance and the laboratory at the other end, you can really get some interesting speciation data, right? So what do I mean by that? What's actually there? You can have a much broader suite of contaminants analyzed for than you would typically be requesting from your laboratory. So they're a fantastic screening tool when you're looking at those metabolites and things that Brent 
uh, is so passionate about as those compounds break down, it helps to provide some of that information. But you can see that picture on the right, you know, that's a pretty high uh, density of sampling locations. And one of the services Beacon does provide is they provide back their reports with that sort of data plotted out against your site map. So it does make life a bit easier for you. Things to keep in mind, right? So these vapors are tricky. They like to vary depending on the time of year. They vary depending on whether you've had a rainfall event. There's all sorts of things that get in the way of vapor being a constant. And uh, we certainly have a lot of technologies for looking at that temporal variability, but it does mean that needs to be thought about when you're thinking about how long to deploy your samplers for. Okay, so if you put them in for a day and pull them out, well, you may not get everything that you would if you leave them in for a couple of weeks. So typically, people do leave these sorts of samplers in for longer rather than shorter periods. This schematic just shows uh, an example of how TCE is varying with barometric pressure over a period of time. So once again, vapor concentrations can vary in both the subsurface and indoor air environments due to what we call barometric pumping. Soil moisture is another one, which I've seen a lot of impacts from that. Building ventilation is a classic, okay? So buildings either have a pressurized environment or they can have a vacuum, right? So it all gets down to how they're ventilated. And uh, I've certainly worked on projects where the biggest sort of cause of movement of vapors into a structure was the fact that there was a differential in pressure between outside the building and inside the building, and that can be a problem. So there's a few examples of why this can get a little tricky, but it's also a good reason why to use these sort of passive sampling approaches. Just keep an eye on time. So this one, I really like this slide because we often think, oh, let's, let's characterize our soil. We've done our job, you know, we've, we've contoured it. But i um, not sure how many of you would have been around when we had the Cranbourne sort of landfill gas um, disaster where they had to evacuate a whole lot of homes out there and it triggered a whole lot of new legislation. But what was interesting there that that landfill gas was moving along a whole lot of these structures. It wasn't just moving through the soil. In fact, it was quite well bound up in the soil, but it was shooting along a whole bunch of services and things. And uh, those services, of course, are connected up to houses. So they become a really nice conduit for getting vapors up into houses. So a lot of these sort of vapor studies need to consider both subsurface and your indoor air quality, right? So it's good to do both. You understand the source better, but you're also keeping an eye on the receptor because you could do a lot of work and miss the fact that there was vapors coming back into a house through some of its service services. Hope that makes sense to everyone. Okay, I think I can skip over that. So a little bit on beacon. How do these things really work? They are very simple as Brent mentioned. So they're small discrete absorbent tubes which contain a solid sorbent in an inert container. Now that inert container, it's about five centimeters long and uh, you hang it down inside a tube which you put in the ground by, you drill a hole, you put this uh, little aluminium sleeve down and you hang that down in there, uh, suspended by a little piece of wire that's provided as part of this. Uh, the vapor moves through that little cap and uh, interacts with the sorbents that are inside there. When you've finished the period of time that you wanted to deploy it there, you come along, you remove that, package it up and we ship it off to the US where those uh, uh, contaminants are extracted from those absorbents at a very specialized laboratory. It is an incredibly easy thing to deploy. 
very, very quick. Uh, the nature of the absorbent means you can sample for a really high range of semi-volatile and volatile compounds. That's probably the real secret source here is that being able to get that very big range and also uh, the, the sensitivity of the analysis that they do back in the US. They're suitable for indoor and outdoor assessment applications. And they provide reliable time average vapor mass data, which can be used to inform on further site characterization and positioning of vapor bores. So that last comment's worth just mulling over for a moment. These sorts of things are very useful tools. They guide us to then do further works to further characterize. They're a really good uh, part of an assessment process, but they're by no means the only part of it. You will need to collect other soil data to get your sort of mass concentration side of things. This side is fantastic for characterizing what contaminants you potentially have there and what contaminants are in the vapor phase. So on the right there, just charging through, um, you can see a picture of one of these jars. That's what it looks like. And you can see the wire around the outside of that. So you unravel that wire and you use that to hang the vial, which sort of hangs from a bit of foil that you stuff in the top of your soil tube. I think we might skip over that one. Uh, how well established is this technology in Australia? Well, it very well. It's been around for a long time and it has been utilised a lot on various case studies and audit sites in Australia. Um, this is a CRC report, which um, covers the use of passive samplers. And I would strongly recommend that uh, you obtain a copy of that document. It's um, produced here by the CRC Care and uh, it provides a lot of technical guidance on this. Is there anything there else that I want to cover? So one important point there is they offer excellent contaminant source mass distribution for low diffusion zones, e.g. in high moisture, or low permeability areas. They're also very useful where advection is likely to be limited or can be averaged for the purposes of screening. So those last two points there, they can inform on the location of more quantitative investigations, and they can inform on the need to conduct further remedial investigations to refine remediation decision process is a really valid one. Often people leap to remediation without enough site characterization and spend a lot of money, which isn't that effective. So these provide that high resolution data to allow us to do a better job. I'll skip over a few of these. I want to get to a couple of case studies. Uh, just before I do, so this just shows you what it's like on site. So you see that little toolbox there, that's full of samplers. Um, each one of those little vials is the sampling vial. You, we provide a drill that's used to core the soil and then you put these aluminium tubes into the, into the, the hole that you've created and then you lower those samplers in. So you can is very little you need to carry around with you to be able to undertake one of these sorts of surveys. So it's, it's a really efficient process. Ooh. Skip over that. Just a couple of case studies. So many thanks to Gary Hurst. These are actually case studies that he has worked on. So this is a gas work site in Australia with coal tar, so dense non-aqueous phase liquid contaminants. And uh, they were trying to delineate better the presence of those Dean apples. The site was under audit. 
It had shallow alluvium with an aquitard bedrock at six metres below ground level and groundwater was intersected at four and a half metres below ground level. The dense non-aqueous phase liquid impacts in soil and shallow groundwater included benzene and naphthalene, considered key volatile organic compounds. So they, in this instance, they used 40 passive samplers, installed some targeted, some grid across unsealed areas. So that's worth pondering, isn't it? Where do you put your samples? Do you spread them out on a grid or do you inform your locations with a site history and uh, better knowledge of where the contaminants are likely to come from? I think you do a bit of both. So when they delineated these source zones, they found some unexpected finds, okay? They discovered there were some new waste disposal areas. So if you think about it from a remediation point of view, there were areas that they identified using this that they didn't know about at the start of the process. It informed the need for vapour bores at hotspot locations. Okay, so they found some hotspot locations in that data that's sort of contoured on the right. They observed good correlation between the passive samplers, so the beacon samplers, VOC concentrations, when they compared it with the summa canister samples. Okay, so those two technologies, both covered by Brent, they were getting similar results out of these. Where there were variations noted was where the strata was more permeable. Now, presumably where strata is more permeable, the summa canister's got a broader area that it's potentially dragging those vapors from than the passive sampler, but perhaps Brent can chat about that uh, at the end of this. What did they manage to conclude out of this study? That the majority of Dean Apple mass was in groundwater rather than in the unsaturated zone. Don't know if that's necessarily a good news story. It just means I knew where it was. Second case study. This was an aviation facility in Australia, once again also under audit. Consisted of a shallow estuarine sand, very shallow groundwater, three metres below ground level, with an aquitard at six metres below ground level. Chlorinated hydrocarbon impacts, so TCE and TCA and degra degradation products of DCE and vinyl chloride. Some extended dissolved phase plumes were identified, but source areas were not well delineated, only suspected. Due to the limited access, 100 passive samplers were installed across several source areas all in hard stand operational and access working areas. So sometimes with those sorts of areas, we use vapor pins, which allow you to have a sort of stainless steel cover that sits over the holes that you've drilled through. And that creates an area that you can go back to again and again, if you want to put more uh, passive samples in over a period of time. So just keep in mind that in some areas, particularly hard stand areas, you don't really want to be leaving uh, a whole lot of holes open across those areas. And that's where you do use things like um, vapor pins. So out of that study that they did, source zones were identified and the position of vapor boxes were fixed. Firmed up the scope of further high resolution site characterization to inform the scale of remediation very important, and it reduced the scale of remediation required, so they ended up saving their client a lot of money. Last case study, Australian case study, that is, um, it's a formal textile manufacturer. It was once again an audit site. It had a localised spill of dry cleaning solvent, PCE, over a long period of time. The lateral extent of the source zone was unknown. There were low permeability clays up to 30 metres thick with lenses of cowcrete causing perching 
of PCE pools, creating hotspot vapour sources. Sounds like quite a complicated conceptual model. No impacts to groundwater were uh, that they were aware of. 60 passive samplers were installed, effectively delineated the extent and identified two main spill zones and an external waste area. You can see the uh, configuration on the right. Passive sampler mass deviated significantly from the soil concentration mappings. This is expected given the difficulties in reporting PCE concentrations due to high volatility. So there's a bit of an error creeping into one of those two methods right there. So it's interesting when you get two different sorts of approach to measuring such things. Informed on the use of membrane interface probe and EC mapping of soil texturing to delineate vertical and lateral PCE mass distribution. In other words, what they're saying there, we, we had a little bit of a look at some MIP data earlier in this presentation. They really needed to bring a lot of things together to get a good feel for where this contamination was. A 3D visualization of the Dean Apple source zone was then created. Now I'm gonna stop there because we want a bit of time for some questions. And I can see we've got eight in the chat and one in the Q&A. Now, Brent, this is a little um, observation of human nature. If you tell people to put it in the Q&A, they will put it in the chat. <laughs> I've noticed this over time. But before we move to that, just a couple of takeaways on uh, what we've presented so far. I'll have chips with mine. I beg your pardon? I'll have chips with mine. <laughs> Sorry, Richard. You're good. So soil vapour technology has been used for many years. Brent's been working with it for all of those years. Choose monitoring technologies to match the medium and the application. Okay. So in other words, Brent went through different sorts of ways to collect this data, different devices. They all have their place, okay? And it's important to get some advice on which one to use when. Ensure the analytical suite that you're getting from these, the analysis of these passive samples is sufficiently comprehensive to cover the range of volatile contaminants that they may be that may be present, including your degradation products, okay? So sometimes a compound that starts off, you know, TCE is a good example, it will degrade to another one that's just as bad, but if you're only analyzing for TCE, you're gonna miss out on the full story. So that's why we need a broad range of compound analysis. Soil vapor data should not be used on its own. It requires soil matrix mass data as well, and I'd argue also requires some groundwater data if you're dealing with shallow systems. Development of a conceptual site model is not optional, it's essential, okay? And the more information you have to inform that often means that there's less remediation required, okay? So you ultimately end up saving your clients a lot of money. Now, over to Q&A, Brent. I will read out the questions. I'll start with the Q&A button. This question from Keith Osborne. Given the variability of direct soil vapor measurement, is it better to use predictive soil vapor concentrations modeled from groundwater concentrations for, what's HHRA? Health hazard risk assessment, is it? Something like that. Human health. Risk Human assessment. health. Um, no, I would argue that the modelling is always, because it's dependent on assumptions about how um, things behave in, um, in, in soil systems, and because soil is so complicated and co complex, um, your model is no better than um, trying to get some actual um, measurements of soil gas. Um, it's in fact trying to get that latter measurement better is will give you the best bang for your buck. 
Um, modelling is uh, fraught with all sorts of difficulties and can often lead you up the creek. Um, remembering also that most modelling tends to be very conservative, um, but notwithstanding the variation you can see sometimes in your actual um, monitoring work, if you can um, really think about what you are actually measuring in situ, um, you can often get some very good in situ data that, that is the most useful thing to inform what's going on. Couldn't agree more. Uh, in terms of how we can access these webinars, we will send you a link. They're also available on our website. If you go to the About Us section on our website, we have a, uh, we have a list of all the webinars and you can click on those uh, and access them there. So just go to the About Us section in Hydroterra. Now I'll shift to the chats. Ooh, lots of questions here. Richard, please share your screen. I've covered that one already. <laughs> Excellent presentations. Can you use the passive data for quantitative human health risk assessment? When to not use the information for risk assessment? Oh, okay. That is very similar to the one that was in the Q&A. I think the important point about all of these passive samplers is that they actually give very reliable quantitative data. Um, it's not just presence or absence, but that's, that's how I guess these devices began. Um, but the point I made earlier on about equilibrium concentrations is quite important in this case, um, because what you're getting is these devices are um, calibrated um, in their development by to 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 tell you that you know if the laboratory gets a particular concentration out of the device that is um, within uh, a standard deviation or so of a particular concentration in um, in the vapor phase of the air or air um, so you can use these devices for um, human health risk assessment. Um, they are actually often more reliable than putting in um, soil gas balls um, for a variety of reasons. Um, and, but you do need to understand what is going on with your particular device. I noticed there was a question um, very recently, you know, what's the saturation point of your um, device? That's, it depends on the device and the uh, absorbent you're using. Um, but because it's a, 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 and it will depend on the, the analyte you're after, um, but because it's a key question, um, the manufacturers of all of these devices pr uh, provide tables that say, yeah, you can't leave your passive sampler or whatever brand, um, in contact with vapor above this concentration for longer than however long. Um, but provided you are within that range, um, the, the result is, is meaningful and, and will correlate to the actual conditions in the ground. So how long you leave it there is a big part of it, isn't it, Brent? Yeah, you need to know what you're looking for, um, you need to get some idea of what the concentration might be. And in many ways, these devices are much easier to do that with than, um, you know, sinking bores and hoping. Um, so uh, the exploratory side of things is, is often worth doing with these devices as well. But yes, you do need to, to get some idea of how, um, you know, what the concentrations uh, that you're going to be hunting for. Um, and uh, the device, the uh, information available from the people who provide the device, Beacon, um, Waterloo, Radiello, they'll all tell you how long you can leave things in place um, and how short you can leave things in place um, for that particular device. 
So there's a few questions sort of around this theme or, or comments. That's one from Matt Taylor here. Uh, you know, the temporal variation aspect is a hard one to grasp. How long do you recommend vapor sampling needs to occur to get good temporal data? Um, what's your view on that, Brent? So okay, I mean that was a great slide that showed you know the, these. Uh, temporal peaks but the question is in terms of risk to people do they matter um you know if i was in that space breathing what what determines the actual hazard to me is it the peak level is it some sort of average um or what um and i would argue that a device that measures over a longer period continuously um, would perhaps give you a more useful answer in that regard than trying to you know get a, a measurement every 10 minutes or whatever um, in your system i mean the only way you could actually get those um that sort of those sort of curves if you don't have the resources that the americans seem to have would be to hitch up a uh, gas chromatograph or something to uh, to pump the air straight out of the room and into the the, uh, the, the chromatograph, um, and that's not going to happen. Um, so, yeah, I think the something that takes a longer period and gives you an average figure over that is probably more useful for um, health risk assessment than um, the the kind of instantaneous reading that beacons were talking about. Yeah, so in terms of instantaneous reading, right, so what do you mean by that? Like uh, at the end of the day, you deploy it over a certain period of time and it reaches an equilibrium over that time. Yeah, the, the, um, I guess the concept of instantaneous is, is not correct in using a you know, if you've got a passive sampler like the uh, uh, the beacons or the waterloos or radiello, um, the but that in a sense highlights one of the difficulties of things like summer canisters, that even though they do take some time to breathe in, if you like, um, they're still taking a snapshot of um, um, pretty much the moment um, you open the tap, it goes <laughs> and. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for those sound effects there, Brett. <laughs> um, but the point being that that you know it is it, it is a relatively short time that you're sampling for, and if you happen to pick a time when you're at the peak um, uh, or in the trough, it's it's going to give you a different result. And so again, um, it may be more sensible to look at something that that takes an average. Um, the I think that the the difficulty with with um, something like Summers is is that they that the instantaneous reading is actually not as meaningful as as the average. And you ask yourself the question: Why are we doing this? What do we need to know the concentration in air for? For example, it's usually about the health risk. Is it safe to be in this space? You know, can I live in this room, this house, or whatever with this vapor happening, and I'd argue that it's it's really the average concentration that people are facing, and that that the sorts of technologies we've talked about are, are probably pretty good for that purpose. Okay, it's always the the, the tricky question to answer, isn't it? That one. Mm, yeah. I guess when you've got the summer canister and you turn up on site on a day, and it happens to be one of those days where we've just seen that temporal graph showing highs and lows. If you turn up when it's low, you're going to be getting a snapshot in low conditions, right? And that could affect yep. how you how you tie that into your modelling. So yep. the the other thing that's important with a summer is, as you pointed out, that if you attach it to a ground uh, to to a gas ball, for example, it may actually draw air from a much bigger volume underground than your passive detectors will will um, sample and 
that needs to be borne in mind too. I mean, think about how these things work. And, and if it's always helpful to think about a similar canister being a vacuum, like a vacuum, you know, the device you clean your carpets with. Um, because as soon as you open it and that vacuum starts drawing air out of your target space, um, that's what it's doing. Um, and so you need to consider what the volume, um, the, the effect volume, if you like, of the summer canister is. And similarly for your, your, um, um, your passive devices. Um, but I think the data that Beacon have produced and a number of others, uh, Waterloo's in particular, um, show that they are, those passive devices are particularly good for measuring what's actually in the soil around the, the device itself. So they're much more targeted than say a swimmer canister sucking out of a, 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 a gas ball in the ground. Yeah, no, that makes sense. So Bettina Zimmerman has asked um, what was used to monitor those variations in TCE. I'll have to come back to you Bettina, I'm not sure. That slide was provided to me by Beacon, so I'll have a uh, have, have a look and uh, come back to you on that one. It would be uh, fair to say that virtually all the suppliers have got absorbents that will reliably measure T well the, the chlorinated ethanes because they're so important. Um, so yeah, you know, I don't know the answer to that one, but they they all can. Um, and I noticed there was a question for someone uh, about vinyl chloride. Um, and I have to admit that uh, I very rarely see vinyl chloride in my samples, but that's because it's not there rather than whether or not the absorbent picks it up. Um, I just haven't worked on sites with a lot of VC problems. Um, someone else may be able to comment on that. Um, so I'm not sure which case study we're referring to there. I'd have to have a look back. Um, we're running out of time, conscious of, of that. Um, just a quick one here from Darwitz, the Kelly. What is the saturation limit for the passive sampler for subsurface sampling? Uh, again, that's, that's one of these bits of data that the manufacturers can tell you um, because it's, it's, it is in a sense dependent on the particular matrix you're using for um, your um, um, your absorbent um, and you know beacon will have figures uh, the waterloos will have figures and so will radiello um, and in the radiello case it depends on which particular absorbent you use we can provide those numbers to you yeah um as can most of the labs for the uh, the waterloos and the radiellos now Last one from Matt Taylor to everyone. I agree. Thanks for the response, Brent. These grab samples of vapor representing one moment in time is hard to justify as being representative of the overall risk. Um, and vinyl chloride, chloride oxidizes so rapidly it tends to not stick around. Thanks for those comments, Matt. Um, well, thanks very much, everybody, for joining us today. Um, it's been really enjoyable having Brent on board and uh, many, many thanks to you, Brent, for providing your wisdom. Thanks also to Gary Hurst for those case studies. Um, really appreciate that, Gary, and hopefully next time we can get you here in person. But, uh, great. And uh, let's call it a day. Thanks, Richard. Thanks for the opportunity. It's always good to be talking with you. <laughs> right on, Brent. See you later. Cheers. See you later. Bye, everybody. Thank you.